Aliens. They have always intrigued the human race. We may not really know if they are out there for sure, but the thought has always kept us wondering if we're not alone. Aliens have always been a popular staple in movies, television, and of course video games. You can never get enough of extraterrestrials back in the golden age of gaming. One thing that was commonly missing with most games in those days was the ability to play two players simultaneously. While you could get a few in the arcades like Space Duel and Track and Field, it was hard to come by with home console games. However, there was some hope in the handheld market, and Tandy was able to combine ETs and simultaneous action for a totally unique experience. It's Alien Chase. You know how the main thought of home console or handheld companies in the golden age was to replicate the arcade experience? Well, when you take a look at this bad boy, you wouldn't be wrong in thinking that this arcade cabinet went through Rick Moranis' shrinking machine. If you get that reference, I applaud you. Alien Chase was released sometime in 1984 as a two-player portable handheld that can be intensely fun for anyone. Judging by the original box, it must have been real intense back then. One odd thing I found while researching this is that the original retail price was $40, which sounds rather cheap for something of this magnitude, but adjusted for inflation to 2019, it comes to around $100, which sounds about right. Doesn't it look expensive? I'm surprised to even have this gem in my collection sometimes. Taking a closer look at the screen, we can see the smooth detail of its own bezel with plenty of stuff showing on the right. For example, we have the name of the system and who made it, plus some pictures of things that you'll see in the game with what they represent right next to them. So you'll be able to know who you are, what your opponent will look like, plus all the other bits and pieces shown on the vacuum fluorescent display. This was a pretty popular display for handhelds back then, along with LCDs. There wasn't much in terms of having your television or arcade screens with you on the go to play games. The closest we got in the golden age was the Vectrex, if you do consider that a portable. Underneath the VFD screen is our controls and switches. We of course have our on and off switch, very important to have, it's even signified in orange to let you know how important it is. We also have the ability to turn the sound on and off, which is quite a rarity for handhelds from this era, so this gets some bonus points for that. We also have a difficulty switch, a 1-2 to two player switch, and the neat little rotating joystick that can also do double duty by starting the game or switching the game type. They really thought of everything with this. Now you can rely on this to play during boring school lectures because you can turn the sound off and not get caught. Its size won't be an issue either, I'm sure. I've been saying that this was capable of being two player simultaneous, but I'm not sure you understand the weight of that statement, at least when you consider the time. For as we rotate the handheld around, we can see the screen and bezel display in reverse. So what you see here is player 2's side, as opposed to player 1. However, the real interesting thing is that player 2 has the same screen, meaning you both will be seeing the same VFD game on either side. I don't really understand how that worked. Even by those days, this must have been a feat by itself. Turns out it was done by a little trickery, however, as there's still one display, but it's somehow mirrored for player 2. If you know how that could have worked, please let me know. Also, Player 2 has the joystick as opposed to Player 1 having that and the switches. It's clear to see who has the power, but at least Player 2 will know how the joystick controls. That's always a plus. On the bottom, we see the normal kind of stuff like screws, foot pads where it was made, as well as the all-important battery compartment. Alien Chase takes four C batteries, not sure how long it lasts, never played it for too long, but I would imagine it doesn't last a heck of a long time considering the many things it can do. So maybe it'd be best to find the elusive AC adapter that all these handhelds of the era had that nobody either got or kept. 
Another interesting thing on the battery compartment lid, as you may have noticed, are additional instructions on how the game is played, so be sure to consult that before playing for yourself. We don't really need that anyway, as I'm going to show you how this works firsthand. You may have thought by the title that you would be chasing aliens in some sort of reverse Galaga sort of thing. However, this is a very different kind of game. You and or a friend compete to try and catch an alien without running into obstacles and trying to get it back to your base when it's open before your opponent tries to steal it. This looks like some sort of soccer or football type game, but in space. And even with that setting, it's still a tad underwhelming. I'd be surprised if they made a Space War type game with the VFD. That would have been a real test to see if they could get the ships to run smoothly. But regardless, Alien Chase is a very cool looking handheld. It definitely stands out with that arcade look and its unique selling point of simultaneous two player. It is best to be played with another person for sure. Playing it alone may make its novelty wear out quicker, but it would still look great on a shelf. But if you know you have another person to play with and find this in the wild, I'd say you should get it, so you and a friend could experience a handheld like any other that came from the parent company of Radio Shack. In actuality, it was licensed from the Japanese toy company Tomi, having a slightly different logo as well. The more you know on this channel, right? It's... Alien Chase. You know who else had success in the golden age of video games? Atari! They were so big in the home console market, they could barely be stopped until they eventually crashed and burned. But when they were on top, they were the king. But they never really got into the handheld market proper. They had some attempts at it, which never got off the ground. But one popular toy from 1978 spawned our next episode that wanted you to touch the right buttons. If you think I missed anything, please leave a comment. If you like what you see, leave a like. If you think others could get knowledge out of this, share this video. And if you want to see more, go ahead and subscribe. Now if you'll excuse me, nostalgia is calling.